This is a question that comes up often, and in fact, there's a few questions today that all relate to the same kind of topic. So I'm going to bundle them all together and answer them all together. Can governments launch a 51% network attack? Vasilis asks, governments have an unlimited supply of money. They can print an unlimited amount, and in theory, they can purchase an almost unlimited amount of mining equipment. Since they also have access to free unlimited power, why can they not acquire the majority of the network hash rates and launch a 51% attack to harm the Bitcoin network? They could even bribe all the major pool mining players, distributing all block rewards to them according to the hash rate percentage. To discourage them from further mining. So, what are your thoughts on that? If governments start to feel that Bitcoin is a threat to them and make a collaborative decision, let's say in a G20 summit, what's stopping them from succeeding? What are your thoughts? Well, first of all, I don't believe in this general idea that governments have their shit together, are organized enough, and even enough to collaborate on a global basis to do anything meaningful other than press conferences. You know, if the G20 could get its act together and figure out how to collaborate, maybe they could solve some more serious problems like, I don't know, climate change, um, the global rise of fascism, um, war and diplomacy. Um, you know things like that, for example, poverty. Hey, um, but they can't. Uh, very rarely do governments collaborate on a on a global scale. Now, what if governments really got got it in for Bitcoin and decided they were going to spend a lot of money in order to launch some kind of fifty one percent stack? First of all, you have to understand that what. Uh, can be done with a 51% attack is limited effectively to a short-term denial of service attack against Bitcoin, which would lead to immediate countermeasures, would cost an enormous amount of money, and ultimately would most likely prove that you can't disrupt Bitcoin that way only by spending a lot of money. So governments don't want to spend a lot of money to prove you can't disrupt Bitcoin for very long. That's the most counterproductive thing they could do. It would actually produce enormously uh, positive marketing for Bitcoin, because if they failed in this 51% attack, eventually failed in this 51% attack, it would prove that Bitcoin is resilient. Um, so it's unlikely that anyone's going to try and attack some uh, the Bitcoin chain um, in such an expensive way, when there are cheaper and more effective ways to attack it through law and propaganda and various other things that we're seeing already. So let's go and look at this question in a bit more detail. Governments have an unlimited supply of money. Yes, but if they use an unlimited supply of money, that money loses its value. It's called inflation. So not really. And in theory, they can purchase with fiat an almost unlimited amount of mining equipment. Again, in theory, yes. In practice, no. And part of the reason is that, in practice, that involves uh, collaborating with chip manufacturers who already have all of their capacity booked. Uh, they would have to kick out um, some other private buyer in order to replace their orders with government orders. That gets noticed, or build their own silicon fabrication plant, um, which you know, um, if they did, maybe they would actually produce something valuable rather than just mining equipment to disrupt Bitcoin. So, first of all, it's difficult to buy all of the mining equipment. This is one of the hidden benefits of ASIC mining. It's that you actually need equipment. That equipment is manufactured in some of the more expensive fabrication facilities, you know, seven nanometer and below facilities nowadays. And those facilities are working 24 hours a day and booked months or sometimes even years in advance with orders um, because there aren't that many of them. So it's difficult to acquire this hardware in secret. You could bribe the miners, but first you'd have to find them, and you'd have to persuade them that your bribe, in order to do a very risky 51% attack, is better than the alternative, which is to simply continue mining honestly and earning fees and block rewards that way. And that's always a challenge, because um, just continuing to mine honestly and earning fees and rewards has a very high probabilistically determined level of success. You know that with a certain amount of hash rate, you're going to succeed in finding blocks 
at a certain percentage of the total. And as a result, you have a fairly regular income stream um, in the future, if you already have the mining equipment. Whereas, if you take this bribe from this uh, government to do an attack on the network, yes, if the attack succeeds, you get the mining rewards. But who knows if it's going to succeed? Um, so they need to bribe you a lot more. Let's think about it from a point of economics. If you have guaranteed returns uh, at a certain percentage of blocks, simply by continuing to mine honestly, and then you have risky returns by doing an attack against network consensus that may fail, then that risk has to be incorporated into the bribe that they will pay you, which means that the bribe has to be more expensive than the block rewards that you would otherwise earn by a certain percentage that represents the risk of the attack failing and you not actually getting paid the bribe. Oh, well, that makes it more expensive for someone to bribe than to simply um, use that money to buy equipment to mine honestly. And again, these are the profit incentives that exist in every case. So, could the government launch a 51% network attack? Theoretically, yes. In practice, um, it is a very, very expensive effort with a very low probability of success that may backfire incredibly badly and is far too expensive compared to all of the other ways you could attack the network, which include, um, for example, making the capital gains reporting so onerous that no one is going to do retail transactions, as has happened in the United States. Sending threatening letters from the IRS, as has happened in the United States. Making criminals out of anyone who purchases Bitcoin, or persuading the banks to shut down the bank accounts, as has happened in India, etc., etc., etc. So, um, the reason governments haven't tried a 51% attack is not because they can't afford it, not because they can't try to pull it off. It's because they understand that it's the least likely to succeed of all of the other strategies, and they're trying all of the other strategies instead. Question from Matt. If all it takes is electricity to attack a proof-of-work network, then isn't uh, then isn't delegated proof of stake a more secure way of reaching consensus? If delegated proof of stake is about game theory, and using EOS as an example, you would need to bribe 15 out of 21 elected block producers. Those block producers would then lose their reputation and position as block producers. Not going to happen, in my opinion. What is your opinion? My opinion is that the fundamental difference between bribing miners and bribing block producers is in the beginning of your question, where you say, if all it takes is electricity to attack proof of work. It is not all it takes. Uh, all it takes is electricity and hardware brought together at the right time, in the right place, with the right incentives. and That is an incredibly difficult thing to do. Um, and in a delegated proof of stake system, all it takes is money. Um, to bribe the producers, and the risk of pulling off an attack is their reputation only, but not monetary risk. In a proof-of-work system, it takes a lot of money to bribe the existing miners or buy electricity and mining equipment, but the risk is not limited to reputation. It is also the risk of losing the money you spend on energy. Because no matter what you do in a proof of work system, if you attack the system, you will have to spend the energy again to at least the same extent that you spent the energy the first time you mined blocks in order to rewrite history. The cost of rewriting the past in a proof of work system is the same as the cost it took to write it in the first place. A bit less because you have more efficient equipment, but that's marginal. Whereas the cost of rewriting history in a delegated proof of stake system is um, zero, as long as you collude, then you can. The cost of the producers colluding is zero. They can rewrite the history all the way back to the beginning, and they don't lose anything. So, uh, proof of work. You still have to provide work, and that work is validated by other producers. Now you can change these parameters a bit. You can use checkpointing and other techniques to limit what the block producers can do in a network like this. You can punish them in a more severe way for trying to rewrite history further back. Uh, but the bottom line is that um, 
proof of work produces a different quality of immutability than proof of stake systems. That doesn't mean the proof of stake systems are not useful. But in fact, if you look at the game theory, EOS block producers have been attacked with their reputation and their lobbying and various other techniques. And, um, a lot of proof of stake systems use what they call proof of proof. Uh, one example of that is Veriblock, where essentially what they do is they checkpoint their proof of stake system into Bitcoin in order to protect against um, essentially rewriting attacks and consensus attacks against weaker chains. So proof of work and proof of stake are not entirely equivalent. You can argue that one is better for one type of application than the other. Sure. Go ahead, um, but they're not equivalent, and you can't just simply substitute one for the other. I think there is a good place for both of them, and they can solve different problems. And actually, in fact, I think they work best when used together. So you can checkpoint a proof of stake system and a proof of work. You can use a proof of work system to underpin the security of many other chains, as is done today with proof of proof systems and very block. Tim Wright asks, are chain locks just hype or something interesting? Today, an altcoin called Dash activated chain locks, which they claim makes 51% attacks virtually impossible and makes their blockchain arguably as secure or more secure than the Bitcoin blockchain. Zcoin have already announced that they will be copying chain locks too. Do you think there's anything worthwhile in this tech and how does it differ from checkpoints? Could Bitcoin adopt chain locks. There's a follow-up uh, comment from Jack saying, it sounds like a bit checkpoints based on masternode voting. Um, yeah, that's exactly what it is. So let's explain the technology a bit. In a system like Dash, there are essentially uh, uh, two layers of consensus. There's proof of work. Um, so, sorry, there's a proof of stake system that operates through the masternodes. Um, and in a proof of uh, stake system that uh, operates through the masternodes, in order to operate a masternode, you need to have, I believe, it's a thousand dash um, in order to operate one of these masternodes. So there's many of these, and um, these masternodes have a special uh, status within the system. Chain locks are checkpoints. Essentially, what they do is they vote on a specific block being the head of the current chain. And as long as the masternodes all see that block as um, the head of the chain, um, a certain percentage of them can vote. And once it's received 60% of the votes, I think, um, then that's checkpointed, meaning that um, all of the nodes in the system will reject any blocks that um, are not children of that block. So they will refuse to reorganize the chain. Um, now, essentially what that does is it, it creates a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake system. You can't attack the proof of work with a 51% attack because the master nodes are checkpointing uh, with, a, with a vote using threshold signatures. Um, and once 60% of them agree on the current state of the chain, that locks in that chain with a checkpoint. So it, it's, a, it's a novel and interesting way to do a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake system. And um, Yes, it will make 51% attacks much harder on that particular chain. In fact, if you want to do a 51% attack, you actually have to do a 60% attack, where you either compromise the code running on the master nodes, or you put enough stake, which probably wouldn't be possible, to run 60% of the master nodes yourself. Um, I think at the current rates, that would be like $300 million. So that's not feasible. So, why is Dash doing it? The primary reason Dash and Zcoin are doing it is because we've seen again and again and again that um, systems that have proof of work that has enormous hash rates and uses ASICs like Bitcoin um, are very difficult and expensive to attack with a 51% attack, so they're not attacked. But systems that have lower hash rate or that have hash rate that depends on GPUs, not ASIC-based mining, then people can switch GPU mining from other chains 
and attack a, a chain that's a bit weaker in its hashing power uh, quite effectively. We've seen 51% attacks against Ethereum Classic. We've seen, I believe, Zcoin had a 51% attack at some point. Um, we've seen attacks against a number of other chains, and this isn't, you know. Um, I'm not attacking these chains by saying this. Is uh, it just means that uh, proof of work systems are indeed vulnerable when the chains are brand new and they don't have enough hashing power to make it prohibitively expensive. So uh, a, a chain can only be secure with proof of work if the cost of attacking it far far exceeds the potential benefits of attacking it. It's a game theory system. So if the cost of attacking it doesn't exceed the potential gains, then it will and does get attacked. And we've seen this happen again and again on weaker chains. We haven't seen it happen in Bitcoin. So in that case, if you have a chain that doesn't have enough hashing power um, to really make it completely cost and effective to attack, then you need something else to buttress that. And, and that's essentially what Chainlocks is doing here. It's a hybrid proof of work, proof of stake system. Um, and it's a smart way of doing it because instead of having a proof of, way, a proof of stake system <clears throat> um, on its own, which is vulnerable to um, historical immutability attacks, or a proof of work system, that without enough hash power is vulnerable to 51% attacks. By combining them, you have a system that defends better against 51% attacks than proof of work, and defends better against historical immutability attacks than proof of stake. A good solution for a system like Dash. Um, could Bitcoin adopt chain locks? No. And the reason, at least not in its current iteration, <clears throat> the reason is that chain locks. Um, basically uh, require some kind of Sybil proof um, system of nodes. Uh, Sybil proof meaning that they cannot be Sybil attack, they cannot be faked. And the only way to prevent Sybil attacks, the only two ways we know today are proof of work, meaning that you put work behind each node that's participating in consensus, or proof of stake, which means you have to put money up um, behind each node that's participating in consensus. So, um, in order for Bitcoin to adopt chain locks, it would have to have some kind of proof of stake system. Interestingly enough, um, because Lightning nodes deposit a bunch of money in, um, in payment channels and use that money, which is locked into a two, uh, transactions to earn fees and things like that. Um, this is the kind of thing that could cause the emergence eventually of a proof of stake system. But that's a much longer conversation. So, what are chain locks? Are they just hype or something interesting? There's something interesting for chains that don't have enough hash rate to defend against proof of uh, sorry to defend against 51% attacks. Um, they're not really that interesting for Bitcoin. Uh, Primarily because Bitcoin doesn't need them, uh, it has enough hash rate to defend against 51% attacks. Some of the articles I read about this were very, very waffly, um, and they claimed that 51% attacks are uh, a kind of fatal weakness of proof of work chains, and that in fact once miners get 51%, they can do anything they want, including validate invalid transactions and invalidate valid transactions. Not true. There's a lot of misconceptions about how proof of work uh, actually works in these articles. So be careful when you read that. Don't always take it for granted. Uh, some of the facts are wrong. Uh, but an interesting solution from Dash, nevertheless.